Okay, should all be recording now. So thank you very much everyone for joining our Monday evening Lycan talk. It's part of the Saving Devon's Treescape project, uh, which we'll introduce you to in a moment. But just so um, everyone knows, I am Rosie Cockreef and I lead the Saving Devon's Treescape project. Um, and Jess Smallcombe is here from DBRC, who will be leading the training session today. Uh, as I said, any questions you have, you can pop them in the chat box or out, um, or I'll pick them up. Also, I've just noticed there's someone from Lou. No, I'm from Lou originally, so hi. Um, <laughs> had to say a little hello. Um, but yeah, I will pass over to Jess, who's leading this whole session, um, and I hope you enjoy it. Thanks, Rosie. Um, hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm Jess Morgan, and I'm the community ecologist at Devon Biodiversity Record Centre. Uh, so I've been working uh, with Rosie on the Saving Devon's Treescapes project. So a little bit about that. Um, it's a project that has a, a, a number of partners, um, including the Devon Ash Dieback Resilience Forum. Um, and it's uh, Devon Wildlife Trust who are, are sort of leading the project uh, with Rosie. And here at DBRC, we're also involved in some of the citizen science elements of the project. Um, you can find out more about the project on the um, DWT website um, pages there. So these are the partners um, and funders. Just a quick note to them and a, a thank you. Uh, so these are the areas where the project is working, uh, working across Devon. Uh, but mostly focusing at, well, at this stage, focal areas are in blue there, so South Devon, Torbay, Exeter, Cranbrook, um, East Devon, and Neurosh over at Blackdown Hills. Um, we are currently in the pilot phase, so uh, we're just sort of coming towards the, sort of the end of the pilot phase, and there will be hopefully another five years of the project running. So we've got plenty of time to, to get stuck into like in recording amongst other things. Um, some of you may have already been involved in the Brown Hair Street project that we've been running over winter. Um, there's more details about that as well. There's still a bit of time to get involved if you haven't already. So uh, yes, let me know if you're interested in that. So back to lichens and a huge thank you to the uh, local lichenologists who have helped us um, pull this talk together and the list of lichens that we'll be looking at. So Bob Hodgson, uh, Maxine Putnam, thank you very much for your photos and Barbara Benfield, uh, so many photos, so much advice, uh, really, really grateful. And thank you very much to Plant Life as well for coming to our rescue um, last week with a couple more photos. So why are we looking at um, lichens for um, this project? So as we said, um, the Saving Devon's Treescapes project is looking at ash trees and ash dieback. And one of the reasons that they're important for lichens is also because with the Dutch elm disease that um, affected so many elm trees, ash was kind of the, the place where many lichen species found refuge. Um, they have similar bark types in that they're both alkaline and that is important for some of the specialist species as well as generalist species of lichen and with so many trees potentially being lost that's a lot of habitat for lichens to lose as well. Uh, so what we'd really like to do is to start some recording, um, getting people out there and having a look at lichens. So this talk today is going to give you a little bit of a background on lichens as well as a little bit more information on some particular species that we'd like you to go and look for, if you uh, are happy to. And um, another thing I just need to say is that I am not a lichen expert. I am also learning. So uh, please do feel free to ask me lots of questions. I cannot guarantee that I will have answers for you, um, but I have been doing a lot of research and a lot of learning uh, over the last few months. So hopefully um, I can let you know. If there is anything that anyone who knows more than me knows because I've got wrong in this talk, please, please, please do let me know um, so I can amend it. Uh, but right, here we go. So what is a lichen? Um, a lichen is a, it's a dual organism comprising a fungus and an alga or a bacterium, um, sometimes both, that is the photobiont. So 
the photobiont is the part that provides the energy. Um, it does the photosynthesizing, whereas the fungus provides the structure. And it's um, interesting to note that lichens are what is called a biological rather than a taxonomic category. So the, the Latin name you'll find is for the fungus. Um, so each fungus is different in different lichens, but some may have the same type of bacterial algae in them that do the photosynthesizing. Uh, so we've got about 20 species of 20% uh, of fungi species are lichenized, meaning that they um, have this, this photobiont in them. And they, the, the, the combination of the two changes the structure of the fungus. So the fungus on its own is going to look a lot different than it does when it's got the, the alga in there as well to create that dual organism, the lichen. Um, of that combination, about 95% of the structure generally is the fungus with the, the very small 5% being the algal component. So we've got heading towards 2000 species in the UK, uh, many of which are just found with like one, one specimen or something quite rare and others a lot more common and about half of them you can find in Devon um, growing on many surfaces but the ones we are going to be asking you to look for will all be found on trees and we've gone for a list that um, is particularly some of them are particularly associated with ash trees uh, the great thing about lichens is that they are visible all year and in fact this time of year is actually quite good for finding them because the trees don't have all those pesky leaves on that hide some of the lichens on the, the branches. So it's a really good time of year to get out and have a look. But with so many species, it can be really, really difficult to tell one from another. So as I said, I'm gonna give you a few of the basics to look for, and we're gonna go through a few species that we have selected for this project to do some monitoring. Um, so we have tried to choose ones that you can quite simply tell what they are. Um, they don't require chemical tests, which some um, lichens do, because they look so similar, even if you get your hand lens out and look really closely, um, they need to be, uh, it's like iodine and chlorine and different things that you can put on and, and see the reactions. So you don't need to do that with any of these. Um, you can do them just visually. If I take you through, there we go. Um, like lichen morphology. So what we're going to introduce as well is um, quite a large new vocabulary that go with lichens um, and I want to try and use um, all the, the sometimes quite daunting terms because if you go away and you look up any help in um, either on websites or in guidebooks you're going to have all these terms in there so I'm hopefully going to try and explain the main ones to you this evening. So first of all, we've got this um, structure. So you've got the upper cortex, which is the top layer. And then just below that is um, within the fungus, you get those algal cells. So they're the ones they are up at the top to try and um, get the sunlight. Um, then there's a central part, um, which again is, so the hyphal is these um, like fungal filaments um, that provide the structure. And then in Many lichens, you've got a, a bottom section as well. So you've got an underside to it, um, but not always, as we'll find out. So again, some of the ID features that you look at are for um, the, the way that they reproduce. So the fruiting bodies, um, which is the way that they sexually reproduce, but it's only the fungus part, are called, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, apothe apothecia. I do so much just on email and I'm working from home at the moment. I don't get to say it out loud very often. So hopefully I'm getting all my pronunciations correct tonight. And so these are um, the, these fruits that you get on a lot of lichens, particularly the, um, the crustose lichens, which we'll get to in a bit. Um, they can look, um, uh, they're often described as looking like jam tarts with a kind of rim around the edge and a center. And the, the, the dotted lines on that picture there are just because some of them can be on stalks and some of them are quite sort of flush with the, the surface of the lichen. And then there's Isidia and Ceridia. Um, so the uh, Isidia are like little projections, growths that come out from the surface of, of the lichen. And then they can break off and they therefore look like a little package with both the fungal part 
and the algae. Because the problem with the, um, the apothecia way of reproducing is that it's just the fungus. So the fungus needs to go and land somewhere where it will then take on the algal component as well. Whereas with the Isidia and the Ceridia, so that's um, this other one here on the right with those tiny little packages of both fungal and algal components to go off and land and grow somewhere else. And the final bit is, uh, final option is sometimes, um, just so you know, bits of lichen can break off some species and they can, um, as long as they land somewhere suitable, and grow from there. So these are all some technical terms, but things that we will um, be referring to when we talk about how to identify different species. So I've come together with a little list of some of the technical terms that I'll be uh, probably saying quite a lot, some of these through this evening's talk. So there's the thallus, which is like the main body of the lichen. Um, so that's that, that image that I showed you, the, the drawing um, that's got the, the cortex and the alcohol cell and the medulla, all of that together, the thallus. And then there's the prothallus, which is the edge of the lichen, which sometimes has a different color. Um, there's the hypha, so the fungal filaments, apothecia, isidia, and ceridia. Um, and just so you know, the ceridia are the tiny little bits that, the, the powdery bits that come out, but the actual bit that produces them is the ceralia. So there are all these difficult terms and I, I apologize. Um, I will only use them when I need to. And um, the rhizines, which are the bits that attach the lichen to the, the, the substrate that they're growing on. There are also, uh, if you look in guidebooks, so many different terms for, for the different lichens and what they grow on. Um, the ones that we are going to be asking you to look for are pretty much all going to be growing on bark, although some of them you can find growing on rocks and, and other um, substrates as well. So pictures of actual lichens now. We've got the crustos lichens. These ones are quite thin, they're quite flush with the bark. So this picture here is actually lots of different um, colonies of the lichen. Kind of coming together so you can barely see the bark at all under there they're um, really really well attached to the substrate um, if you like scratched at them um, you couldn't remove them without removing some of the bark as well then there's folios lichens um, these ones are kind of leafy um, they you can you can actually see they've got a, a top and a bottom so those those leafy bits that you can look underneath and see what color the underside of those um, loaves are like and they are attached by rhizines um, and they can come away a bit more easily and then the fruticose lichens which are those lovely classic bushy lichens that you get on really old trees and they are kind of just attached at one point and they branch off from there so those are our three types um, the species we've got are, are pretty well just in one or the other of those but you do get annoying ones sometimes they're not annoying they're beautiful that fall along that scale so our first lichens um, I've split them up into those three different categories so we've got the crustose lichens as I said really well attached to the substrate so in my, my little drawing there they don't actually have a, a lower cortex as such because they're just those um, fungal filaments are so well attached into the, the bark um, they're generally quite thin, um, so some of them have barely risen at all above the surface of, of the bark of the tree. And the apothecia are frequently present in this type of lichen. So the first one, I've got a really beautiful lichen here. And um, this is now I have to uh, say out loud all these Latin names. So Arthonia cinnabarium, uh, which has a light grey brownish Thallus. So that's that main body of the lichen, so kind of the, the background. Um, the prothallus, so again that's the edge, is brown. And then the apothecia, these are the red bits in this picture. So they are the fruiting bodies and they are um, up to only half a millimetre wide. So what we're talking about with all these, uh, they're, they're often very, very small. So when you're going out looking for lichens, you really, really need to take a hand lens with you. Um, some of the big bushy ones, obviously, you can see, but if you want to get up close 
um, and see all these different ID aspects, you really need to have a hand lens. So these apothecia are white um, underneath, you can just about see um, going at, um, so sort of with a red powdery top to them. And you get the apothecia sort of in little groups. So you can see that there are some that are, um, hope you can see my mouse there, um, some that are uh, kind of on their own and others that are in little clusters. Uh, which is uh, an ID feature of this species. Um, and you get them in shaded areas on smooth bark. So for example, young ash trees are have very smooth bark. So our next one, this is a beautiful lichen, Graphis scripta. Um, the thallus is white gray color and it can be smooth or slightly wrinkled. And then the apothecia are completely different shape in this one. So rather than those um, round shapes that we saw. They're actually elongated and stretched out and uh, they're curved and squiggly and that is of course the technical term um, to describe the, the way that they sort of radiate out. There are two species of graphis that look quite similar. Um, so in this species that we're looking for, Scripta, the edges of the apothecia are really smooth Whereas in elegans, which um, you can also find, it's, it's reasonably common, um, the edges are, are furrowed, so they're kind of bumpy. And also in this one, um, you can see, you can almost like see the, the inside, so they're kind of white on the inside, which you don't get so much with um, elegans. And occasionally there's a powdery white coating, but you really do need to get up close with your, your hand lens um, to see that. Um, I, I think this is pronounced Thelotrema lepadinum. Sorry, I'll get really nervous now when I'm saying this in front of so many people. Um, and this is a great lichen. So creamy, white, grey, and it's covered in what look like warts. So the thallus has sort of grown up and there's a little hole at the top of each one, um, which is up to two, well, the, the actual mounds are up to two millimetres wide. And if you look in the holes, then you can almost see sometimes the apothecia in there, which gives it a really, really like barnacle-like appearance. Um, so again, there are some other species that look similar, but to look for with this one is that the, the holes at the top of these, these wart-like structures are quite round rather than being um, slits or something and uh, the colour of the lichen is quite uniform. Um, so you get some that are um, so a little bit more patchy in colour, so that it's, the colour is quite uniform in this one. So those are our cross-dose lichens. So this is the list that we're, we're going to be asking you to, sort of, to look at. So I hope that I'm not going too quickly, um, just so you know that um, we're going to send out in the next couple of days a slightly edited version of this or as, a, as a PDF that will have um, the information on there as well for you to, to look at. Uh, so don't worry about trying to write down everything right now. Um, the talk will also be available as a recording, obviously, um, later. So moving on to the folios lichen. So these are those ones that are sort of, they look quite leafy and they are attached to the substrate with, with rhizines, which are, again are these high full like fungal filaments that attach them. So they're not completely attached. So there are some bits that are loose, so you can sort of turn them over. Um, they're flat, so there's a very definite an upper surface and a lower surface. And they can really um, vary in appearance if they're wet or they're dry. And just so you know that with most um, descriptions of lichens. If you look in guidebooks or online, that is a, a, a description of a dry lichen. So if you're going out and it's just been pouring rain, which it probably will, seeing as it is January and we're in Devon, um, they, you know, if you're looking at, at guidebooks, then things might look ever so slightly different. Uh, so on the folios lichens, uh, the fruiting bodies, so the apothecia are generally a little bit, uh, they're, they're rarer. Um, not all lichens have apothecia, but that is that the majority will produce them. 
um, at some point in the right conditions. So here's one, Palmelia sulcata. Um, so the phallus is a greeny gray, almost with a, a bluish tinge, brownish tips. Um, so that's the, the upper surface. Uh, the lobes are up to five millimeters wide and they're ridged. So by that, um, you can see um, up here, um, you can see where there's sort of these, these little lumps and lines and a network. And they are the serralia. So remember the serralia are the kind of openings in the thallus that then produce the, the seridia packages for reproduction. Um, and they develop along these, these ridges, um, well, they, they, they form the ridges, um, which are generally kind of this white network that almost look like veins across the upper surface. If you flipped over one of the, the lobes, it's uh, really dark, black underneath, um, with the rhizines obviously that then attach. And this picture does have um, apothecia in it, but it, uh, they're quite rare when you go out and look. Now this is an amazing um, lichen. It's called lungwort. Um, some people might know of this one anyway. Um, it's really rare. It's found in good quality old woodland habitats. So we have a bit of a stronghold in the southwest and all along the sort of Atlantic coast is where you'd find this one. Um, the thallus is um, generally pretty bright green and the upper surface is shiny and um, wrinkled and the lower surface is pale. Now these lobes, in the last one I said they were up to, I can't remember now, but we we're talking in millimetres, weren't we? These ones are up to 25 centimetres long. So this is a big lichen. Um, and it's because of the, the shape of the, the lobes and these ridges that form on them that almost look like veins that made it look like lungs. And so um, back, in, back in the olden days, when people used to look at plants and see if they had some sort of likeness to a body part and then they would um, use it as medicine for that, then this species was collected a lot in order to help with lung conditions. Um, whether it actually helped, I, I do not know, but I doubt it. Um, Apothecia are rare, and as I said, West Country is still a stronghold, so you can find this in um, some of our, our sort of top quality uh, woodland areas. Oh, I should say that those bottom two um, pictures, they look the same. One of them is when it's wet and one of them when, is when it's dried out. So you can see the colour change. It's much paler and browner when it's dry. And that's a, an example of what can happen with a lot of these lichens. <coughs> Excuse me. So from one that you only get in really good quality habitat to Xanthoria parietina, which you find almost everywhere really. This one is really, really resistant to air pollution. Uh, so I found these, I live in the middle of Exeter and I found these in my local park and you can also find it um, on top of roofs and things. So the um, lobes are up to seven millimeters wide. They, as you can see with these two pictures, they can change, um, not change color, but they come in different colors. So. They can be really bright orange or they can have a greenish grayish tinge to them as well depending on how much sunlight they get so it's that algal layer underneath that will change depending on the, the amount of light it receives um, the edges of the lobes um, can often be turned up so you can see that in like this picture here they're, they're, they're flipping up um, and then underneath the surface is very very pale white with those risings that attach it to the surface. Um, when you get into looking at different species, you can get risings that are different shapes, but we're not going to go into that much depth with these ones at the moment. The apothecia are really common in this species, um, really numerous. You get loads in the centre of the thallus, um, and, but you do get them pretty much 
you know, all over it in, in some cases. So they are round, they're these proper um, jam tart structures that I was talking about earlier. So round with the orange center and the pale margin. And these ones are quite, they, they, they do protrude quite far from the phallus. So they're almost on stalks, but not, not quite. So an indicator of really nutrient rich habitat. Um, so lots of, lots of nitrogen. And you get them where um, some of our slightly more sensitive species won't, won't grow um, and really, really resistant to air pollution. So you will get them in the middle of town. And they're common on rooftops as well where birds roost. So where birds roost and they leave, a, leave something behind them that might be nutrient rich, um, this uh, species can still grow. So I've got a little photo of a roof there, which um, has some orange on it, which is quite likely to be this species. So there are some species that we are not going to go down to actual species level, but we're going to ask you to look for um, just to genus level um, because they are quite rare and they're quite hard to identify. So simply getting it down to genus level is enough because that is still really good information for us. Um, and Sticta is one of these, uh, is a genus that we're asking for that. So these ones are, they're often quite large. They, uh, their general colour is brown to greenish brown, quite dark, um, rare, but sort of you do get them in the West Country. And again, often ridged on the upper surface. There's one, Sitta limbata, which when it's wet smells like fish, uh, which is, uh, I don't know, a useful indication, if maybe not a pleasant one. And they like damp habitats. Um, so there's a couple of images there of um, different species and I've completely forgotten to put which species they are in my notes so I apologize uh, but these ones they're, they're, they're much larger and they like to grow amongst these sort of these mossy damp um, logs and places that you see in these pictures and then again they're Kalema species so going just down to genus and these are the, the, the jelly lichens. They are um, folios, but some of them are pretty well attached to, to the bark. Um, so they might be quite difficult to, to scrape off. Not that I'm suggesting you do scrape them off because um, they're rare and they're nice. Uh, and they take a long time to grow. But when they're wet, the thallus swells up so that it goes sort of a little bit more, more like jelly. And then when it dries out, it, it, again, it goes quite thin and, and crispy. Or looking crispy um, and they again are usually really dark colours so very very dark green brown colours and uh, again obviously you know they're ones that soak up water they like damp places and you'll often find them amongst, amongst moss. So these ones we've got um, again please forgive my pronunciation Clemma berthoraceum at the top and Clemma subflacidum on the bottom. Uh, but we won't be asking you to, to look down to species, simply knowing that there's Glemma. And these are ones that are, are um, well associated with ash trees as well. This is a really beautiful lichen. Um, thank you, Barbara, for this gorgeous photo. Um, Anapticia, Ana, going to get a tongue twister here. Anapticia ciliaris. And this one looks like the Fruticose lichen. Um, but it is actually one of the folios lichens. It's just that the, the lows of the lichen are um, quite long, they're quite narrow, they can be up to five centimetres. Um, so they're narrow, getting wider at the ends, and they've got these, um, these really nice brown uh, structures at the end of um, the thallus. Uh, and if you look under a hand lens, it looks a bit furry. The lower surface, is white so that's how you can tell it's a, a folio lichen because it's got a very definite upper and lower surface um, but it doesn't actually have that lower cortex so although it has two sides it's got the upper cortex and the algae and the medulla and then it's just a matte of hyphae um, underneath uh, so you can get apothecia um, in unpolluted areas and they are black discs so like those jam tarts um, and black uh, it's quite rare. I had a look at um, the distribution map 
and it's generally found in the eastern half of the county. Um, but obviously, if you find it in the western half, uh, that would be super exciting. This one's a bit more common. It's another one that looks folios, but it is actually, um, oh, sorry, that looks fruticose, but is actually folios. And this is Avernia prunastri, uh, also known as oak moss. So this is a really common one. Uh, the thallus, again, is uh, branched and flattened, um, pale grey green with a pale underside. Um, but that pale underside does sometimes have patchy green in it. Um, the top of the thallus is a bit ridged in older species. So you can see, um, like in some of these, these ridges and almost like veins along the top. And it's really common on deciduous trees. It can, particularly when it's young, be quite easily confused with another species of lichen, uh, which is on our list. So look for the ridges and the colour difference um, and see if there's a, a distinctive top and bottom side to it. Um, and it's also softer than the, the ramelina that I will talk about in a couple of slides time. So that was the last of our folios lichens and I've got a couple of fruticose lichens as well. Um, so the fruticose lichens are these lovely ones that you see in really old woodlands, the, the big sort of beardy, um, uh, beard lichens is actually the name for the Osnia species genus. Um, and they are round. So there's no top and bottom surface like there was in the fo uh, folios lichens. Um, the um, whole of the, the thallus has got a layer of valval cells all the way around it. So you're not going to get that color difference even if they are actually flattened. So the, the Usnea species are round, but you do get some species that are flattened, but they are the same all the way around. And they're attached by one point. So they have rhizemes that attach them, but it's not, um, not kind of in different points. It's kind of one rooting section and they branch out from there. So this is uh, the Ramelina that can easily be confused with the um, uh, the Prunastri, so the, the, the couple of uh, slides ago. So as you can see, it's quite similar. It's got this pale grey green thallus that is flattened and branched and it's narrow. Um, but this one, one of the ID features is that those branches are slightly curved. And uh, what I mean by that is like, um, if you think of the profile of a, um, a gutter, but not quite as pronounced, so it's that slight curving to it. Um, this one is Ramelina farinacea and it is it gets its name from these farinose ceridia. So we're learning that's those little granules um, and it's the, the, the farin is the, the flowery so it looks like they're covered in uh, being dipped in flour. And the cerealia, so remember that's the structures that produce the ceridia, are oval. So we've got um, pictures here, you can see they come along kind of on the edges, so where it's flattened, all along the, the margins, um, so yeah, marginal ceridia, um, is where you get these slightly oval structures that will have this kind of flowery um, appearance to them. And that's generally how they reproduce, so the apothecia are quite rare in the species. So to separate it from um, the other one, look for the curve, look for the marginal ceridia and the uniform colour all the way around. Uh, we, there is another species of Ramelina, which you'll find, um, you might even recognise it um, from this picture, which have these um, kind of trumpet shapes. This, is, this one isn't on our list, but it is called Ramelina fastigia. So if you find that one, um, you'll be able to identify that as well. I just thought I'd throw that one in there as you're bound to find, um, find it if you're looking for the Avernia prunastri and um, the Ramelina baronacea. And this, I'm afraid I'm, I'm looking at the time and I've realised how quickly I've rattled through all these species. So this is actually our last one and it's uh, Fusnia articulata. So it's grey-green thallus. I mean, this is a really gorgeous lichen. Um, 
it's round, so it's that, that cross section that I showed you earlier. It's a, that's a cross section of a, a typical usnia. And it can be up to one meter in length. So these are the beard lichens. These are the ones that, that just grow streaming from, from old woodland branches. Um, and this one has the, the sometimes used common name of a string of sausages lichen. So if you look at um, like this picture here, um, where these main branches are, they often have indentations um, every so often. So it looks like a string of sausages. And these ones are really, really sensitive to pollution. So you will only find them in really remote um, places generally. Um, but, uh, well, nice, clean air. And again, we're lucky, you know, the Southwest is a stronghold. So that is all our lichen species. I'm sorry that I've, I've rattled through them really quickly. Um, as I said, we're going to put all of this information in um, a handout that we will send you after the talk as well um, in the next couple of days. And uh, I'm about to move on and, and um, tell you also different places you can look for, for help when you're identifying lichens as well. So um, I'll put all of that information on the handout so that you'll all have, have that information. When it comes to recording them for um, the Saving Devon's Treescape project. Uh, some of you might be familiar already with the web-based app we've got for the project. Um, this is a screenshot of the homepage where you can record um, notable trees and it's also where you can record the brown hair streaks. And there is a page for lichens. It's not completely finished yet. So um, if you're really, really keen, you might need to wait two or three days, I think, before it's actually finished. Um, in the meantime, with that information that I'll send you out um, in the next couple of days, I'll send a recording form as well. But that's the link for the Treescapes app. It's on the um, Wildlife Trust website. So do have a look at that. And you can also see how to get involved in other aspects of the project. So help and references. As I said at the beginning, I am um, not a lichen expert. I am hoping that some of you will, would like to, to sort of learn along with us as we go through this project over the next few years, recording different species. And uh, as I put this talk together, there are some really, really good um, resources out there that I found. So there's British Lichenology Society. There's some great um, ID information and photos in the Fungi of Great Britain and Ireland website which is um, set up by the British Lichen Society and um, Kew Gardens and there's a couple of other um, groups involved in that as well. Uh, there's a really good book um, on lichens if you, if you start to get really keen um, by Frank Dobson, um, but that's at the more expensive end of the scale or you can get FSC charts if you're looking, um, if you want something, a guide with you. Um, it doesn't have necessarily all of our species on it, but if you just get bitten by the lichen bug, which I think I have, I'm afraid, um, then they're good ones to have. And Plant Life as well have got some really good resources uh, for uh, some of the long-term projects that they have been running. And of course, the guide that uh, we'll send out following the talk. So thank you very much for listening. I hope I haven't completely overwhelmed everyone by um, throwing information at you. Um, we're really, really looking forward to this aspect of the project and um, getting it off the ground. We know it's quite a big undertaking because lichens are quite difficult and they're also quite small and uh, there's all these technical terms, um, but I have found that they are they're really, really interesting. So once, once you start looking, they're so interesting um, that I really hope that um, you will help us to survey. Um, so yeah, Rosie, back to you. Thank you very much, Jess. I'll say thank you uh, from all of us. Thank you if we were all in a room or out in the field as we had hoped to do these train sessions, you'd have a mini round of applause now. Um, but I, you can just imagine that everyone is doing <laughs> that from home instead. There's some few people on cameras clapping. So um, <laughs> well done. Um, and well done on pronouncing all the names. Thank you. Um, 
but we have some questions that have come in now um so i will just work my way through them um as i said might be that we can't get an answer to you right now but we will take away any questions that we can't answer now and aim to get an answer to you within the next week um so we apologize for not doing it now but i'll start working my way through them um so if a lichen is in danger of dying as it's on a host tree which is due to be felled can it be transplanted or can cuttings taken from it um so this is uh, something that I've, I've never done, um, but in my research, um, the answer is yes. So there is, for example, the um, uh, Lubaria pulmonaria, yes, um, lichen, that, that really big one, the one that's like up to 25 centimetres long. That one has been struggling and they are doing translocations of, of that one. Um, I think they're even doing them in Devon, but they've been doing them around but by they, I think it's plant life, um, have been um, transferring. If, I, if I'm wrong, then um, someone correct me, but I, I believe it's plant life who've been doing transfers, translocations. Okay. Um, quick question, will this be on YouTube? Yes, I'm recording it. So the aim is that hopefully it will record properly and I can upload it to YouTube in the coming week. So fingers crossed. You see, you can listen back anytime. Um, as a correction for the one that smells fishy, Yep. which I'm not going to try and pronounce what's been said. <laughs> it's in the chat box. Okay. Um, I, I, it's really hard for me to see this chat box when I'm, I'm um, sharing my screen, but I will look. So yeah, I'll, I'll pass it on to you afterwards. I won't try and embarrass myself by saying it. Um, so diff different stick to Yeah. Okay. Are there any advice for a good hands lens? Where can you buy one from? Hands lens? Um, oh, that you can buy them all over the place. So um, either from... Uh, a shop that does um, that stocks uh, ecological equipment or online. Um, I have one that actually my my mum gave me years and years ago, which is quite small. Um, you can get some really good ones that have um, lights in them as well. So you can get those. Uh, they're various prices depending on where you, you look. Um, one of the things with lichens, and it's why it's really hard to get a good photo of them sometimes, is because they grow in, or well, the ones we're looking at, grow in woodlands where it's actually quite dark. And so by the time that you've, you've got this up to your eye and you're really close, it can be really dark. So having one with a light on um, can be really, really useful. So there's a tip. You can find hand lenses all over the place, but one with a light is really useful for looking at lichens. Great. Um... Good question. What is the purpose of recording all this data? Why are we gathering it? Ah, well, um, what we would like to look at is um, because this project is going to be running for five years and we're hoping that we can get some really good information now um, and hopefully continue maybe some of the, you know, people get bitten by the lichen bug, keep this um, information recording going because if the ash trees are going to be affected as much as we fear they are, then we'd like to see if there's a knock-on effect on various other species, um, such as lichens that, that live on them. And to do that, obviously, we need to know what's there now. So we're going to start um, start now and hopefully continue this for a few years to see if there is any notable changes or if we can um, just see the ranges of some, of some of the species that we already know are a bit rare um, so we can keep an eye on them as well. Yeah, so yeah, it's part of the wider Saving Damage Tree Scape project, We're looking at several different species, which are all key indicators of tree health. Um, so we're trying them all this year to see what results we get and to see how interested people are to help out as well. The brown hair streak butterfly has proven to be very popular with lots of people going out and monitoring. Um, and then liking is something new for us all, to be honest. Um, and so it's gonna be really interesting to see yeah, what results we get from it. Cause yeah, as I said, there's like nearly thousand lichens out there and they're very hard to identify um so i don't yeah not many citizen science projects go to the scale of um yeah of getting volunteers to do it so it's gonna be really interesting to see what data we can get from um following on from that is how are you wanting us to record them um so we have set up that page or well, almost set it up on the app um, so that's a good way of uh, recording it. We're going to be asking for the standard um, recording things. So who you are, what you've seen, where you've seen it, when. 
Um, and then we're also going to ask a couple of other questions. So what species of tree was it on? Um, and we're also looking at um, the size as well. So um, so, so we, can, we can see, uh, if, particularly if you find one and it's the only one for, for a while, how, how big a cost it is. If you're there and you've got tons of Avernia prunastri all over a tree, uh, you don't need to tell us how big all of them are, um, but just roughly. Uh, just so we can note that, because that's a, a bit of an indication on age as well. Uh, so we can see, yeah, how long they've been there, hopefully. Yeah, so a few questions linked to that as well, um, which I can answer. So one is, do you have to download an app? No, it's a web-based app, so it's just um, that web link that we shared. So you can use that either um, when you're out and about, you can just get it up on your mobile phone, or you can use our paper form um, which Jess will share as well. And then you can either send the paper form into Jess or go home and then upload it when you're back at your computer as well. But you don't need to download anything to do any of that. Yeah. Um, and as Jess said, there's various questions on that. So um, one of the questions here is, are we just looking at ash trees? So the answer is no. Um, they'll be on a whole host of different things. Um, and on that form, you'll be clicking which species you found it on as well, because that will help us. Um, yeah, so basically you'll follow follow the questions and then that should help explain easily how to do it, I think. Um, but we're always here to answer questions if um, I have, I'm gonna have to try and say this now, aren't I? Yeah. I have Labaria pulmonaria. Yeah. And yeah. um, that is on a lot of fell trees. <laughs> if it likes alkali bark, which other tree can I move it to? Oh, that's one I'll have to get back to you on. Okay, we'll jot that one down. Um, so, yeah, is is the aim of the project because of the loss of ash trees and the importance that lichens play as an air quality indicator? Are they an important food for birds as well? Um, the lichens themselves, I think, are not always the food, but lichens, particularly when you get a, a community like such as you get on this this tree that's in this picture. Um, you get so many insects underneath them. Um, it's actually, I've, I've jumped back a couple of times looking through my hand lens and something absolutely minuscule runs past, but it looks like a giant um, under the hand lens. So many things live underneath in within that habitat. And also it's uh, an important bird nesting material as well. Right, um, another one. I just missed is um will taking photos help yes absolutely so the reason there is a delay to the app is while we um get the photo taking as part yeah. that's why the, the form is up on the website um but we just yeah the developer needs a bit more time to add the photo yeah if you take photos then we can um well we i say i say we I mean jess um can help identify them as well if you are unsure um for a um, there's some recommendations for hand lenses for anyone that was looking, people have put where they bought theirs. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, lots of people saying well done, great talk. Um, recording, so we're happy to, for people to take it, um, do recordings anywhere in Devon. And I guess I will add on to that as well because we've got people outside of Devon here. If people are outside Devon, where should they submit the findings? So um, best place to submit them is to your local record centre. Um, so if you if you look at sort of whatever county you're in um, and then type that into your search engine with record centre, um, you will probably um, come up with, with your local centre and then they will um, also probably love your records. Um, so send them there if you're outside Devon. But within Devon, um... If someone's asked are there specific areas within Devon but it's just anywhere locally to you especially at the moment with limited travel and um, just anywhere from your door basically I yeah. think is right is that right Jess? Um, yeah absolutely so you know we're not we're not encouraging anyone to, to travel out to far flung um, remote places at the moment um, so so stick always within the government guidelines stay local and like I said, I live in the absolute centre of Exeter and I went to the park over the road at lunchtime and um, there were lichens on trees there. And uh, most of them are, well, a lot of it's Anthoria parotina, 
but it's still a really pretty lichen. Um, so go and have a look at that. So we we have included some that are really common, as well as some that are quite rare. So that there's a sort of you know you should always be able to find something. Um, sometimes you'll find something like really exciting. Um, and we've included ones that are found within cities and those that need really, really clean air as well. And a lot of these lichens will be found on trees other than ash. Um, just that we, we, obviously because of the scope of the project, we did sort of look at ones that um, will be found on ash trees. Uh, so someone says, we found followers type lichen high up on branches mm -hmm. or tall oaks, but not on the trunk or low down. Why is that? Um, maybe it depends on, on where that tree is. Um, so some of the photos that, um, I took, which I, I hope are right. So anything that wasn't credited here was, was me. So any mistakes are mine. Um, but some of them were on trees and like looking up into canopy were absolutely covered in the folios lichens, but also some of the branches just at head height had them as well. Um, that might be because uh, the photos I took were on a friend's private land out in the country. So um, there was nobody uh, going near the tree and touching them, um, which could be part of the issue. Um, maybe there are certain areas that are picked off or browsed by, um, possibly deer browse some of them. Um, I know that there's, uh, you know, that in, in some places um, they are a, a staple food when there's not a lot else because they're not particularly nutritious, um, but it's possible. Ah, there we go. Um, lots of deer, yes. So that's that could be the reason why. Um, Some of them. Any tips on tree ID when there are no leaves? Ah, well, <laughs> Rosie's, sm <laughs> Rosie's smiling because uh, I'm, I'm actually doing a talk for Devon Wildlife Trust um, to do with a, a different project um, uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, to go to Jess's talk basically and she'll help you identify them. <laughs> that's, that's a start. There's also, uh, there are some really, really good resources online. If you can't wait that long, um, the, uh, I think the Wildlife Trust do um, some pictures, but also the Woodland Trust do a really good, just like handy guide for twigs. So um, I also use an app called Picture This where you take a picture of it and it tells you what it is, which is very handy. It is. Don't always, always, always trust the first no. option. <laughs> it's, it's pretty good that one but yeah I and do pay really, for really it. Good now. um do we want lichens only on trees or are other wooden structures or logs okay as well yeah i mean um the i think on the uh recording form we're sort of putting is it on a tree or is it on other but if um if you find something that looks interesting on, on um a bench or a fence post uh, yeah, then um, have a look, and if it's if it's um, if it's on our list, send it in. So that's the thing with the the, the Treescapes app, like and bit. We've actually got a drop down box of the the species that have been in this talk. Um, but if you think you've got something else, um, then we're going to add other, um, and then there's a note section. So please let us know what you think it is. So although we are focusing on these species because we're trying to, we've tried to come up with some that um, people will be able to, to recognise an ID and um, we have to draw the line somewhere because if, if everyone's sending in the, what they, they think might be something, um, we're probably never going to get to the bottom of the, the list. Uh, but if you do find something else and you, you are pretty sure you know what it is, then um, yeah, send that in as well. Great, I'll just do a couple more questions and we'll finish up at seven. Um, how do we get to your talk? I assume you mean the one we just mentioned about identifying trees, in which case I think Joe, who is organising the talk, is on this call. Um, and I will, um, initially, well, I'll, when I, I'll send up a follow up email with all of the links from tonight yeah, that we mentioned and I'll add that talk in as well so that you can. Yeah, um, it'll be, it'll be on Eventbrite like all the others have been. So. Great. And then I think the final question I've seen, which I've now lost, um, but I think it said, how old do trees have to be before lichen starts forming on them? Oh, they, they start really um, when they're quite young. So I'm trying to think, I did have a photo. I don't know if I can share my screen again. Um, but I did have a photo in the talk 
um, of a tree. Oh, there we go. Um, I'll see if I can very quickly do this. I won't keep the. Um, Well, while you do that, someone has also just offered some advice. I'm yeah. um, saying lichens need well lit trees, therefore look at the ones on the edge of woodland and parkland. Oh. Yeah, so I've seen that. Where is it? There we go. Oh, I've gone too far. Oh, my computer's being really slow and doing that thing where it takes ages to catch up. Um, this one here, so this you can see that this is that you cannot see the bark in that picture. All of that is lichen and that is on an ash tree that um, has been planted in the last 20 years. And um, all those splits are where obviously the, the tree is still growing and it's breaking through the, the lichens. Um, so they do start um, on trees when they're really young. I've seen ones that are, you know, just the chunks are the same size as my, my arm and they've got lichens on them. So you can find them early on, um, right. particularly the clusters. Great. Well, I think I've covered everyone's questions. Apologies if I missed any. Um, but thank you so much, Jess, for tonight. And thank you everyone for taking time out of your evening to join us as well. I really hope that some of you will take on the challenge and head out there and try and find some lichen to help our research. Um, it really is so so valuable to our project um, we're in our first year at the moment and we just yeah as just said like kind of getting a base for everything and starting um but this yeah will hopefully go on for at least the next five years so it'd be really valuable to have those records for the project and for future research as well um i'll send a follow-up email in the next couple of days just with all of the links that we've mentioned tonight um some link, more links for the saving devon's treescape project as well so you can see other ways to get involved um and for future talks um, but yeah, thank you very much for attending um, and I hope you'll have a lovely evening. Thanks, Lots everyone. of virtual clapping. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Good night. <laughs>